Greater Miami and the beaches. They've become one of the most popular vacation destinations in the world. Each year, over nine million people come to Miami. They come for the sun and the surf, the nightlife, and the food. They come to see and be seen. But there's another side to Miami, a side that has been here for over 50 years and makes Miami even more interesting. I went in search of the other Miami, and when I found it, I loved it. And I think you will too. So please join me, Bert Wolf, for Travels and Traditions in Miami, Florida. Miami Beach. Magic name of a miracle city evolved almost overnight from the tropical jungles of a mangrove swamp. The men and women who started developing Miami and Miami Beach at the beginning of the 20th century decided that the best way to attract attention to their community and profit from its growth was to project a single coordinated image. Come to the playground in the sun and live it up. And they spent the entire century telling that story to the entire world. And for over 80 years, that's the image that Miami has been promoting. And for most of those years, it has been accurate and complete. But that is no longer the case. Greater Miami and the beaches have become a center for cultural arts and design. To come here just for the warmth in the water is to miss much of what this area has to offer. Let me show you what I mean. Two, three, one. Two, three, one. Ta-da, ba. cha ta The Miami City Ballet is quickly becoming one of the most respected ballet companies in the world. It was founded in 1986 by Edward Villela, the first American-born male star of the New York City Ballet. My mother was a frustrated dancer. She was an orphan, never had opportunity. My sister being a year older, my mother thought, oh well, here's a way to live vicariously. She took my sister off to this local school in Bayside, Queens, where we grew up. And I used to hang out in the streets and do what I did best, and that was get into physical trouble. Uh, one day I got whacked in the back of the head with a baseball, knocked unconscious. My mother got upset and said, there's no way we are going to trust you on the streets of Queens anymore. So I'm nine years old, I get dragged to my sister's school, and I have to sit there and watch 40 giggling girls, their mothers, and me. And being this physical guy, to sit was nearly impossible. And I was so bored, they were doing all these soft, poetic gestures. I was out of my head with boredom. Ah, towards the end of the class, they started to jump. I went in the back, and I started to fly around. I said, hey, you know, oh yeah, I'm, I'm OK at this. I can do this. And I was doing it better than they. So naturally, I made fun of it. Uh, I got a dirty look from the teacher. I thought, maybe I'm in trouble. I, I was. The teacher said, you either get him out of here or stick him in tights at the bar. I got stuck in tights at the bar, and that's how I began. Today, the Miami City Ballet has over 15,000 subscribers and over 10,000 single ticket buyers each season. It appears all over the world and is busy creating works that incorporate the social dances of this century into the traditional ballet of the past. To see the Miami City Ballet in action, is to see the future of music and ballet in America. As the Miami classical arts community grew, it not only became a place where great artists came to perform, but also a place where young artists came to train. The old Lincoln Movie Theater at the heart of the Art Deco District on Miami Beach has been converted into the headquarters of the New World Symphony. It's North America's only full-time national training center for young orchestral musicians who want to prepare for professional careers. Chris Dunworth is the orchestra's president and chief executive officer. Really what we've become known for is a unique training program that 
focuses on the individual, on the individual musician and bringing out the artist in the individual musician. Our vision of an orchestra now becomes a whole group of interlocking ensembles. Each part of the orchestra is a chamber group unto itself and the musicians are performers within that chamber group and it's up to the conductor to bring all those different interlocking ensembles together. And with that type of vitality and that type of communication, you get a totally different kind of performance. The idea for the New World Symphony came from the conductor Michael Tilson Thomas. If you're in Miami Beach between mid-October and the beginning of May, stop into the New World Symphony. Another organization that will give you a look at the musical future of America is Jubilante. It started out in 1995 when a group of friends put together a vocal group to help celebrate Black History Month. Since then, it has expanded into the Jubilante Vocal Ensemble and the Jubilante Symphony Orchestra. The orchestra is one of three in the United States that are primarily managed and staffed by minority musicians. Now, the mission of the organization is to promote, to preserve the music of the black American composers. Uh, all the way to, from the Negro spirituals uh, to the gospel music of today, but also the music that has got that classical uh, flavor to it. Uh, there is gospel music, but there's also the gospel influence in the classical music. Today they're performing at Vizcaya, an Italian Renaissance villa built in Coconut Grove by James Deering in 1916 and opened to the public as a museum of Italian decorative arts. Ubilati musicians represent the mosaic tapestry of Miami. Um, we are of all racial makeup, religious makeup, um, we are professionals um, within the cultural makeup of Miami. What is unique about Jubilate and the Symphony Orchestra is that we have taken um, one component that we think is very important, and that's by adding 13 to 18 years year of age uh, gifted students uh, to our orchestra to give them a professional seat in the orchestra which will allow them to uh, hone their craft and be a, a better uh, professional um, as they take their ranks into, the, into their uh, professional opportunities. That's the essence of Vibalate, is capturing those rhythms and bringing the community together for one purpose, and that's to enjoy our heritage and our freedom. But Miami's interest in creativity is not just limited to music and dance. The city has some outstanding art museums. As a matter of fact, the part of the creative community that is most available to tourists is made up of painters and sculptors. This is Lincoln Road on Miami Beach. During the mid-1980s, it looked like a set on Miami Vice. Today, it is a busy and beautiful center for shopping, eating, and entertainment. One of the organizations that played a major role in this revitalization is the Arts Center, South Florida. In partnership with the city of Miami Beach, 
they purchased a series of storefronts and converted them to artist studios, which they made available to a group of artists who were long on talent but short on cash. The studios are open to the public who come in, chat with the artists, and if they like, make a purchase. Here on the road, I get to meet my collectors. I, you know, there's that personal contact, which I realize they quite appreciate too. They like having a bit of a personal view into the process and to where this work that, that they have on their walls came from, how it came to be, and they don't get that in a gallery situation. Some of the great things about being here at the Art Center is that uh, not only can you create your work, you can display your work here. Um, I have set my studio up with some zones, sort of gallery zone, display zone, a more casual zone, and specifically this painting loft. And it allows me to have some privacy, but yet keep my space very open and accessible to people. So in a way, we gain a lot from the public coming in, but we also give a lot because we act as instructors. We're able to teach them about art, perhaps in ways they've never been as intimate in their teaching, to see it actually being created, to ask how it's done. Well, this painting, it's about uh, Avenue of Trees. Uh, basically, there's no particular place. It's just, uh, just my imagination, and I just call it Avenue of Trees. So it's a work in progress, as you can see. And I feel like I'm home, so that's why I feel like uh, I like to work at the Art Center. The Art Center on Lincoln Road is one place to meet the artists who live and work in Miami but you could also visit many of them in their private studios. For example, you could drive into Coconut Grove and pop in to see Lisa Remini. Coconut Grove is an artist's colony that is home to the Coconut Grove Arts Festival, which is the largest in the U.S. The things that inspire me to paint are tropical light and all the subject matter involved therein, you know, the, the type of cloud formations in the tropics, the plants, the flowers, the, the water and the colors that the water changes to from sunrise to sunset to moonrise to moonset. It's like, it's infinite. You know, you can just carry on forever. I have no, I have no, no shortage of subject matter to go on here. My favorite spot to go for inspiration in Miami is Fairchild Tropical Garden. They have the largest collection of palms in the United States. They have an amazing array of flowers and cactus and all sorts. Things. They have a moonlight walk twice a year that I go and draw in the moonlight. And of course, there are art galleries. The Bernie Steinbaum Gallery has an outstanding collection of art with new pieces being added every few months. One of my favorite works of art is Bernice. She had a successful gallery in New York but sold it to start a new life in Miami. I chose Miami because I think it's the gateway to Latin America and I'm very curious about those people coming to Miami for second homes or for all of the time. Uh, Latin America does have a history of buying art. I'm very interested in seeing new work all of the time. And of course, because I reside in Florida, I'm very interested in looking at Floridian artists. One of the artists um, that I have been looking at is a young man named Carlos Betancourt. I'm very taken with how he uses the landscape and how he brings his own personal history into the history of Florida. He did a very large piece on the beach that I thought was extraordinary. One of the most interesting manifestations of Miami's interest in art and design is the recent development of the Miami Design District. It consists of over 50 stores packed with some of the finest home furnishings and unlike most other design centers in the United States, it is open to the public. Traveling to Miami to shop for furniture may sound strange, but when you consider the range of stuff available in this district, sun, surf, and a sofa makes an interesting combination. I love that lamp. More than anyone else, Craig Robbins has been responsible for the redevelopment of the area. We see our mission as always attempting to find the next frontier. And having done most of what we can accomplish in South Beach, we've now chosen the Miami Design District as our next location of focus. 
This is the um, gondola shoe by Antoni Miralda, the Spanish artist. It was made actually to fit the Statue of Liberty and serves both as a public art sculpture and the vessel. You can kick the heel off and sail in the canals of Italy, <laughs> of Venice. I love it. This is the Moore Building. It's our most spectacular historical structure. It houses Leia's Gallery, which is this extraordinary collection of antiques and, and uh, paintings. Next to it is Waterworks, which is a very upmarket and important uh, home uh, bathroom fixtures. And just around the corner is ICF, which has contemporary furniture. The great thing is to see the different showrooms and how they combine into a fun destination to come hang around and see design. Knoll makes some of the world's most beautiful contemporary furniture. My personal favorite is the Gary chair. Dilmos from Milan opened its first showroom in the Miami Design District in the United States. They, more than anyone, challenged the line between art and furniture. Holly Hunt is without a doubt the most important showroom in the United States, and she has done this spectacular 25,000 square foot space with Allison Spear in the district. One of her principal designers, and what's really made Holly famous, is her association with Christian Liagra, the French designer who has brilliantly mixed contemporary design with primitive influences. In this neighborhood, we've assembled the best of everything from the floor up. Fantini's handcrafted mosaic floors are undisputably the best in the world. They've imported all of the materials from Europe and come here and do these beautiful both residential and commercial projects in the United States and, of course, around the world. Fantini is probably best known in Miami for having done Versace's beautiful home. Miami's interest in good art, architecture, and design is very much part of the philosophy of the hotel I stayed at. But in spite of the fact that there is a sign on top of the building that says Tiffany, I did not stay at the Tiffany Hotel. I stayed at a hotel called The Hotel. And the reason The Hotel is called The Hotel is a story all by itself. During the late 80s, Tony Goldman, a real estate developer, teamed up with Todd Oldham, the fashion designer, and turned it into a great place. Just before they were about to open, Tiffany, the jewelry company in New York, sued them to prevent them from using the name Tiffany. Well, Tiffany the jeweler had more money than Tiffany the hotel, and Goldman settled out of court. Can you believe that? Who would think that this was a jewelry store? But Goldman has a good sense of humor about the whole thing. The Landmarks Commission insisted that the sign stay, which makes the whole thing a little bizarre. The roof of the hotel has a fantastic view of the Atlantic Ocean and the beach. So Oldham designed an emerald-shaped swimming pool. The lights in the public spaces are shaped like diamonds. There are constant reminders of precious stones, and in fact, the entire place is a jewel. Which includes Jessica Goldman, Tony's daughter who took me on a tour. Now this piece is a perfect example of the craftsmanship and artisan work that you'll find throughout the hotel. This piece is colored glass, textured glass, and antique glass, and we sourced it from all over the country, and one woman came and hand cut and hand placed every piece. And it really is very much like a piece of art. Some of the other things that you'll find, um, the inspiration that we took was really from the original Art Deco era. So the floors are original terrazzo floors. And if you look at the, fa the fabrics of the furniture, they really have a, a terrazzo feel to them as well. The inspiration for the rooms really came from the beautiful environment that we're in. When you think of Florida, you think of the sun and the sky and the, and the blue waters and the beautiful sand. So that's where you get your, your blues and the beautiful blues and greens. And if you look at the carpeting, it kind of gives you a sense of the sand. It certainly and does. We really wanted to take all of those wonderful elements and all of that warmth and bring it inside. And, and that's why you have all this, the colors and the textures. The wonderful thing about the bathrooms is that there are so many beautiful elements. They're all hand airbrush tiles, seven different types of tiles, oversized um, rain heads, custom designed cotton bathrobes from Todd Oldham. We also have mirrors in the shower so men can shave. I don't actually shave, but I trim a little over here and the mirrors were very convenient. 
Todd Oldham has a deep dislike for bad art. Whenever he stayed in a hotel room where the pictures were just too ugly, he took them off the wall and put them in a closet. He also believes that everybody has their own sense of uh, <clears throat> what's good art. Accordingly, the walls of the hotel have frames that contain only mirrors. The hotel is listed as one of the historic hotels of America, which is part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And it's right smack in the middle of the most fashionable neighborhood in Miami Beach. As you might expect, at the same time I was working my way through the cultural aspects of Miami, I kept an eye out for the culinary. So what's cooking here? The News Cafe on Miami Beach's Ocean Drive started out in 1987 as an ice cream parlor and slowly grew into the hottest hangout on the beach. Based on the idea of a European cafe, it's a spot where people who live in the neighborhood, tourists, models, even television journalists come in to have a coffee or a meal and read the newspaper without being rushed. It's open 24 hours a day, every day of the year, and it's always an interesting place to see what's going on. So many people told me about this place that I felt I had to stop in. It's called Pizza Rustica, and Pino Piroso owns the place. We use all fresh ingredients in these pizzas. Uh, we get fresh tomatoes, fresh mushrooms, fresh herbs every day from the market, and that's how we put all these wonderful pizzas together. One of my favorite ones, the potato pizzas, made with roasted potato, rosemary, roasted peppers, black calamantales. Then we have our signature pizza with pizza rustica, it's prosciutto, basil, fresh plant tomatoes, sun-dried tomatoes, and artichoke hearts. The four cheese pizza is wonderful with four kinds of cheese. Also, we have the arugula salad pizza with fresh arugula, fresh tomatoes. It's also a wonderful pizza. We have the chocolate pizza. It sounds weird, but <laughs> it's not sauce and cheese. It's a wonderful pizza crust, baked richly and, and, and crispy, and cut in half and sprayed with chocolate Nutella, like a chocolate croissant on the form of the pizza. Redfish Grill in Carl Gables sits at the edge of a sandy beach that faces out on Biscayne Bay. You can sit out under the palm trees and stars and enjoy their baked and grilled fish specialties prepared by Denton Hudson. Yucca on Miami Beach's Lincoln Road is an upscale, sophisticated Cuban restaurant with a sense of humor. Yucca stands for young, upscale Cuban American. But it is also a play on yuca, which is the starchy root vegetable that's a common ingredient in Latin American cooking. We started with stuffed Spanish peppers with porcini mushrooms and a blue cheese sauce. The main course was a dish of lobster and shrimp in a rich saffron fish broth. And dessert was a coconut creme brulee served in a fresh coconut. Well, that's a brief look at how Greater Miami and the beaches have been presenting themselves as a vacation spot for sun and surf, and how alongside that Miami, there is another Miami of classical music, ballet, art, design, painting, sculpture. I hope you've enjoyed this visit, and I hope you will join us next time on Travels and Traditions. I'm Bert Wolf. You can watch this program and link to hundreds of other Bert Wolf programs free at BertWolf.com. There's information on how to tour the same places, plus Bert's slightly irreverent take on history and culture. It's all at BertWolf.com. I'm nine years old, I get dragged to my sister's school, and I have to sit there and watch 40 giggling girls, their mothers, and me. And being this physical guy, to sit was nearly impossible. And I was so bored, they were doing all these soft, poetic gestures. I was out of my head with boredom. Ah, towards the end of the class, they started to jump. I went in the back and I started to fly around. I said, hey, you know, oh yeah, I'm, I'm okay at this, I can do this. I was doing it better than they, so naturally I made fun of it. Uh, I got a dirty look from the teacher. I said, maybe I'm in trouble, I, I was. The teacher said, you either get him out of here or stick him in tights at the bar. I got stuck in tights at the bar and that's how I began. Today, the Miami City Ballet has over 15,000 subscribers and over 10,000 single ticket buyers each season. It appears all over the world and is busy creating works that incorporate the social dances of this century 
into the traditional ballet of the past. To see the Miami City Ballet in action is to see the future of music and ballet in America. As the Miami classical arts community grew, it not only became a place where great artists came to perform, but also a place where young artists came to train. The old Lincoln Movie Theater at the heart of the Art Deco District on Miami Beach has been converted into the headquarters of the New World Symphony. It's North America's only full-time national training center for young orchestral musicians who want to prepare for professional careers. Greater Miami and the Beaches. They've become one of the most popular vacation destinations in the world. Each year, over nine million people come to Miami. They come for the sun and the surf, the nightlife, and the food. They come to see and be seen. But there's another side to Miami, a side that has been here for over 50 years and makes Miami even more interesting. I went in search of the other Miami, and when I found it, I loved it. And I think you will too. So please join me, Bert Wolf, for Travels and Traditions in Miami, Florida. Miami Beach, magic name of a miracle city. One, two, three, one. Ta da, ba, cha cha, ba. The Miami City Ballet is quickly becoming one of the most respected ballet companies in the world. It was founded in 1986 by Edward Villela, the first American-born male star of the New York City Ballet. My mother was a frustrated dancer. She was an orphan, never had opportunity. My sister being a year older, my mother thought, oh well, here's a way to live vicariously. She took my sister off to this local school in Bayside, Queens, where we grew up. And I used to hang out in the streets and do what I did best, and that was get into physical trouble. Uh, one day, I got whacked in the back of the head with a baseball, knocked unconscious. My mother got upset and said, there's no way we are going to trust you on the streets of Queens anymore. So Evolved almost overnight from the tropical jungles of a mangrove swamp. The men and women who started developing Miami and Miami Beach at the beginning of the 20th century decided that the best way to attract attention to their community and profit from its growth was to project a single coordinated image. Come to the playground in the sun and live it up. And they spent the entire century telling that story to the entire world. And for over 80 years, that's the image that Miami has been promoting. And for most of those years, it has been accurate and complete. But that is no longer the case. Greater Miami and the beaches have become a center for cultural arts and design. To come here just for the warmth and the water is to miss much of what this area has to offer. Let me show you what I mean. Two, three, 